what the, the topic of my subject tonight is uh, about money. You might suspect that I'd be talking about money, but anyway, uh, and I title the, uh, the topic money, a good servant, but a poor master. Now, of course, we need to know exactly what is money. In a, you know, in a technical sense, money is uh, nothing more than a medium of exchange to uh, recognize and accepted item of value that can be more easily transported than a, you know, a physical item of which is exchanged. You know, you can't very well do uh, barter uh, very well. So we use money. It serves a very useful purpose. And nowadays money does not have to have any intrinsic value. You, know, you can look down throughout history and been many items that have been used for money. In modern times, of course, uh, when money is mentioned, you know, we think of coins and paper. That, that's what comes to mind. But in a spiritual sense, money is a little harder to define, uh, at least in the minds of those that are not spiritual. There's uh, many years ago, there was a uh, time of greater concern for spiritual values. We just don't have that anymore. Uh, many, a London newspaper offered a prize for the best definition of money. And it was uh, awarded to a young man whose definition was, money is an article which may be used as a universal passport to everything except heaven and as a universal provider of everything except happiness. A good definition, I, I think, uh, portrays the benefits and deficiencies of money. Now, we do need money. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. We need it to buy the necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter, and what have you. The usefulness of money is in the things that it will buy. But money corrupts because of the very thing it was designed to do, buy things. We are warned in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy the 6th chapter, verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Also in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now mammon can be translated as avarice, that is greed, uh, deified. Of course, the verses following verse 24 tell of a proper approach we must have to the things that money can buy and indeed must buy in order to sustain this physical life. And many other scriptures speak of the dangers of the love of money. First John, second chapter, verses 15 through 17. Now I want to tell you a little story that I heard of a mother who trained her daughter to love things that money could buy, but never taught her the things that money couldn't buy. A young lady of 20, a child of rich parents, was trained by her mother in all the arts of fashionable life. The daughter was happy amid the flatteries of her admirers and the mother's pride was satisfied. Soon a sickness of death came upon the young lady and she trembled. In her dying hour, she said, uh, called uh, for her fine clothes. They were brought. Looking up to her mother, she said, these have ruined me. You never told me that I must die. You taught me that my life in this world was to be happy and enjoy the vanities of life. What could you mean? You knew that I must die and go to judgment. You never told me to read the Bible or go to church at least to make a display of some new clothing. Mother, you have ruined me. And a few moments later, she died. 
And it is good to have money in the things money will buy, but it is also good to occasionally make sure we haven't lost some of the things that money can't buy. The writer of Ecclesiastes had something to say about money and the things it can and cannot buy. In the fifth chapter of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes verses 10 through 16, he who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver nor he who loves abundance will increase. This is also vanity. When the goods increase, they increase who eat them. So what profit have the owners except to see them with their eyes? The sleep of a laboring, laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. There is severe evil, which I have seen under the sun. Riches kept for their owner to his hurt. But those riches perish through misfortune. When he begets a son, there is nothing in his hand. <clears throat> as he came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came. And he shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a severe evil. Just exactly as he came, so shall he go. And that's probably where we got the uh, old saying, you know, you've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. <clears throat> the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, some say, described the problem with money, or as he calls it, silver. Money and abundance are not sufficiently, are not sufficient to satisfy one who loves silver cannot be satisfied with all the silver he wants because there's just not that much silver. The wealthy man finds that he cannot enjoy more than a fraction of what he has acquired. Others partake of that which his own toil had earned. Money cannot buy happiness, <clears throat> but it seems that everybody wants to give it a try. The successful man worries with his own wealth the fear of losing it balances and, and often counterbalances the enjoyment of acquisition. <clears throat> the abundance of the rich prevents good sleep, much to his detriment. It is said that money is, is important, but it not if it is acquired at the expense of health. <clears throat> Riches perish through misfortune and cannot be taken with us, uh, with us when we die. A person's character is put to a severe test when riches suddenly perish. Also a person's character is put to a severe test when riches suddenly appear. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, verses 19 through 24, Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself uh, treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, or where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye, therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? <clears throat> if therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I have more people sign in here. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. It is not that it is wrong to have earthly treasures, but our focus should be on laying up treasures in heaven. I would that uh, all of you have treasures here on earth, the more that you can give to the Lord's work. But if and only if you do it in pursuit of laying up treasures in heaven. 
reasons to lay up treasures in heaven, then the nature of earthly treasure is insecurity and impermanence. Moth and rust destroy, you know, material things are perishable. Thieves break in and steal, material things are subject to theft. There's also a loss due to inflation, stock devaluation, bankruptcies, faulty investments, and the list goes on and on. The nature of heavenly treasure is security and permanence. Neither moss nor rust destroys. Our treasures there are imperishable. Thieves cannot break in and steal. Our, our treasure there is securely guarded, reserved in heaven. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses 4 and 5, God has begotten us again to an inheritance in, incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Your treasure is where your heart will be. That is where your affections, your hopes, your desires will be. If your treasure is on earth, uh, that is the material, your heart will experience much disappointment. Earthly things will decay or to be, be destroyed or be stolen or lost or in some fashion fail to deliver on the hope that you've placed in them. If your treasure is in heaven, your heart will not suffer disappointments. As the scripture says, your treasure is incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away. Nothing can take your treasure away from you, for it is reserved in heaven for you and kept by the power of God through faith. Now, let's talk about the metaphor of the eye just for a moment. Uh, I'm going to be reading some from Adam Clark's commentary. Matthew 6, 22 says, The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Now, this uh, single uh, is kind of perfect, means perfect in the structure as to see objects distinctly and clearly and not confusedly or in different places to what they are, as is often the case in certain disorders of the eye. So this is what it means. If, if everything's healthy there the way it should be, you're going to see the things the way a, a good healthy eye would see. Now, talking about the evil eye in verse 23, he's talking about a, a disease or defective eye so an evil eye was a phrase in use uh, common among the ancient Jews to denote a, an envious, covetous man or uh, disposition, to a man who complained about or yearned for his neighbor, neighbor's prosperity, loved his own money, and would do nothing in the way of charity for God's sake. So, you know, the sound eye is a better for to point out that the, uh, the simplicity of intention, purity of affection with which men should pursue the supreme good. And if you don't have that good eye, but you have that evil eye, you know, what a state of darkness that is. Let's explain, talk about the metaphor used by Jesus. If one single-mindedly pursues that which scripture defines as good, that, that is, stays focused on that, then the eye can be said to gaze on the good, single, as the King James says, single in its love for the things of God. And one can be said to be filled with light, that is goodness, righteousness, and truth. You might want to uh, look at Ephesians 5, uh, chapter 5, 8 through 10. If it is on the evil, however, that is full of envy, envy, grief, covetousness, and the like, then one's soul is filled with darkness, selfishness, wickedness, and falsehood. 
Thus, the need for Jesus' warning to guard what goes on in your eye, that is, what you allow yourself to dwell upon. Remember, there is such a thing as the lust of the eyes, that is, materialism. And the need for Jesus' instruction to be rich towards God, free from covetousness. Let's, let's look at the moment at the uh, parable of the rich fool found in uh, Luke 12th chapter, verses 13 through 21. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought with himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will stir, store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will, will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. Now, Paul likewise warns of the danger of materialism or covetousness. In 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, verse nine, he says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and the snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Well, what happens when there's a desire to be rich? One, it leads one into snares and temptations, into many foolish and harmful lusts, and they drown in destruction and perdition. The very next uh, verse says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And strayed from the faith and their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. <clears throat> We need to make God our master because no one can serve two masters in the 24th verse of Matthew 6. A master by definition demands total loyalty and we are unable to please two masters at the same time. Such is certainly true with God, Exodus the 34th chapter verse 14. Mammon, that, that's Aramaic for the deification of riches, is evidently no different. We have to choose between God and mammon. When wealth is coveted and becomes a priority in our lives, it becomes a God. Ephesians 5, uh, 5th chapter verse 5 and Colossians 3rd chapter verse 5. So the choice becomes one as to whether we shall worship the one true God or be idolaters falling after a false God. Choose to serve God, as Jesus would later say, seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, chapter, verse 33. Do this and, and God becomes our, our master. Since we can't serve two masters, this effectively eliminates mammon from being our God. In conclusion, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, gaining and enjoying material things is not sinful in and of itself. Indeed, we must gain material things to provide for our families. In 1 Timothy, the fifth chapter, verse eight, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Or as the King James says, an infidel. And we need to provide for others in need. Ephesians fourth chapter, verse 28, let him who stole steal no longer but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Now, God wants us to enjoy what we have. In 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, verse 17, it says there, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So, Riches are made to enjoy. Uh, 
but we must not neglect the other things that the riches that provide. In Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter, verses 18 through 20, you know, the writer there says, here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor, which in which he toils under the sun in the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage. And for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. For he who will not dwell unduly on the days of his life, because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. Yet proper enjoyment requires a heart properly prepared for giving. In 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, verse 18, let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. In Acts, the 20th chapter, verses 35, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So the question we have to answer, are we laying up treasure in heaven? Now Jesus told us why and Jesus and Paul told us how. So we need to think about these things and uh, like I always say, Money is a very useful servant, but a terrible master.